Besides fancy motorcycles and some sword characterization that gets thrown out at end story window halfway through the show, one of the main discerning features of Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds as a series were the several synchros which periodically served as the ace monsters of the main characters, those being the so-called Sino Dragons. Existing as only four dragons during the first two seasons, the titular concept of 5Ds was betrayed by the time the show was over due to introducing two additional dragons, raising the total to a whole of 6Ds, cause, cause there were six of these. The overall level of playability of these monsters was extremely varied, ranging from meta-defining to questionable, leaving a lot of room for discussion about their application. Most of the Sino Dragons also had several evolutions and alternate forms, as well as archetypes related to their style of play. In this video, I'll go over all the Sino Dragons and their variants, grading them on a scale from 1 to 5 Ds, as well as briefly commenting on how their related archetypes and support cards affect their potential playstyle. I will also refrain from talking about the anime to any large extent, because that's a can of worms that takes way too long to open. If I, by any chance, heavily insult your favorite Sino Dragon, keep in mind that it was probably in my full intention to do so. So let's kick it off. The Stardust Dragon. Oh. At the risk of elaborating on something the entirety of the Yu-Gi-Oh fanbase is familiar with by now, Stardust Dragon is a level 8 Wind Dragon Synchro with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, and if at any point a card or effect is activated that would destroy a card on the field, you can tribute this monster to negate and destroy said card, and during the end phase after activating this effect, Stardust Dragon returns to the field. Not only was this type of negation effect extremely unique for the time, and hell, it still is given the amount of generic negate and pop effects we keep getting to this very day, but the card itself remained a staple generic level 8 Synchro for so many years. The unique tribute and return effect wasn't just a weird gimmick either, given that it could potentially protect Stardust Dragon from a threat on the field after negating a destruction effect acting as bait, although it did mean you lose a 2500 body, so it was a tough gamble to make sometimes. Really, the worst thing about the card is that it's fairly format dependent for its usage, seeing how simple destruction effects aren't always the primary source of trouble in the meta, and synchro decks aren't always relevant. Regardless, the original Stardust is still the best protagonist ace monster, not deserving of a ban list, so despite it being a pretty middle of the road card, at this point in time, it would feel wrong to rate it any less than 5, even though realistically it's somewhere between a 3 and 4. Now, a bizarre gimmick that ended as awkwardly as it began before having to wait almost a decade for any semblance of support were Assault Modes, involving a normal trap card that let you put a Assault on your Synchro monster to summon a powered up version of it from the main deck. Stardust Dragon Assault Mode, as is tradition, is 2 levels higher and has 500 more attack and defense than the original, can only be special summoned by Assault Mode Activate and it revives the original from the graveyard when it's destroyed, and basically it has the same effect the Stardust Dragon, except that you can negate any card or effect instead of just destruction. It's literally a straight upgrade over the base form aside from the summoning condition, although the recent wave of Assault Mode support made it monumentally easy to access not only an Assault Mode version of your favorite Synchro, but also to easily swap between the entire main deck Assault Mode lineup. This makes Stardust Dragon Assault Mode go from a great card that's a bit too tricky to summon to a solid boss monster of a competent deck. Give him 4 of these. Stardust Dragon's first Synchro evolution was Majestic Star Dragon, a level 10 Synchro with 3800 attack and 3000 defense, requires Stardust Dragon, Majestic Dragon and one non-tuner monster. During either player's turn, when your opponent activates a card or effect, you can tribute this card, negate the activation and if you do, destroy all cards your opponent controls. Once per turn you can target one face-up monster your opponent controls, negate its effects until the end of this turn, and you can activate one of its effects as this card's effect once per turn. During the end phase, target one Stardust Dragon in your graveyard, return this card from the field to the exit deck, then special summon that target. Before indulging into this thing's effects, let's quickly put a spotlight on the effort needed to summon it. It requires not only a specific level 8 synchro monster, but also a specific tuner named Majestic Dragon, a fancy pink dildo whose only effect is that it can only be used for the synchro summon of a majestic monster. Does it offer any benefits to counteract this restriction? None whatsoever. As if that wasn't bad enough, other than those two, you also need to have a level 1 non-tuner on the field, which is where the question goes from how good a card's effect is to if it's even worth summoning in a first place. And the answer is... not really. Don't get me wrong, the effect itself kicks ass, but the asinine summoning condition, combined with the bizarre and pretty unnecessary end phase tag out, makes this one a complete waste. There are better synchros that are easier to summon and way more worth your time. Two and a half of these and that's being generous. As for the other level 10 evolution featured in the anime, we have Shooting Star Dragon, which to this day bears the honor of being the only Yu-Gi-Oh monster whose summon was accompanied by a Masaki Endo insert song, which by default gives it a rating of 10 Ds. It's conchalicious. That bit of bias aside, what we have here is a monster with 3300 attack and 2500 defense that requires one tuner synchro monster and Stardust Dragon as materials, and once per turn, you can excavate the top 5 cards of your deck, shuffle them back in, also this card's maximum number of attacks per battle phase this turn equals the number of tuner monsters among those cards. 
effects. Once per turn during either player's turn, when a card or effect is activated that will destroy a card in the field, you can negate the effect and if you do, destroy it. Once per turn when an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can target the attacking monster, banish this card and if you do, negate that attack. During the next 10 phase, special summon this card banished by this effect. As one would expect, it's another straight upgrade to Stardust, offering simpler destruction negation as well as a somewhat unconventional multiple attacking effect, which can, all things considered, potentially result in massive damage output, and on top of it all, it offers some battle protection in case the opponent plans on getting rid of it with his perfectly ultimate Great Moth. It's a neat package of effects with one glaring downside of requiring a specific Synchro monster, that being Stardust Dragon, and another Synchro monster, which is a Tuner. Excel Synchro, as the type of Synchro monsters that require only Synchro monsters as materials would come to be known, was a brand new concept at the time, and it flew out the door with a pretty impressive monster that actually saw some competitive relevance. However, as time passed, shooting Star Dragon was relegated from a solid boss monster in the occasional win condition to a sort of plan B, as a backup for a certain other monster we'll get to in a moment. In the long term, the most relevant thing to come out of shooting Star Dragon's existence was what was essentially the best tuner synchro monster in the game for a long time, that being Formula Synchron. Shooting Star Dragon gets 3.5 Ds, primarily due to the annoyingly non-generic summoning condition. Next up is a notorious son of a bitch that for the longest time was basically considered the boss monster not only for the Stardust series, but for the entire synchro mechanic as a whole. Enter Shooting Quasar Dragon, a level 12 light dragon with 4000 attack and defense that requires one tuner synchro monster and two or more non-tuner synchro monsters and has the following effect. Must be synchro summoned and cannot be special summoned by other ways. This card's maximum number of attacks per battle phase equals the number of non-tuner monsters used as its synchro material. Once per turn during either player's turn, when a card or effect is activated, you can negate the activation and if you do, destroy it. When this card leaves the field, you can special summon one shooting star dragon from your exodeck. When the anime version of Quasar was revealed back in 2011, people were taken aback by its ridiculous bunch of effects and assumed that the real card would be nerfed into the ground, be it a way heavier summoning condition or excessive trimming of the effects. Turns out, neither was really the case. The summoning condition stayed perfectly intact and was actually surprisingly easy to achieve in decks focused on synchro spamming, and while the anime version could attack once for each synchro material instead of just the non-tuners, all of its other abilities were nicely condensed into an extremely powerful universal once per turn negate and destroy effect without any clear downsides. In addition, Quasar will always have the ability to attack at least twice, which can be pretty busted when you put it on a 4000 attack body. Hell, it can even clear a full field of perfectly ultimate great mods. Finally, the floating effect gives you a reason to run Shooting Star Dragon even if you never have the intention of summoning it properly, and as we already established, that's a pretty good card on its own. Quasar still kicks ass, and the summoning condition wasn't as hurt by Master Rule 4 as it may initially seem, because if there's any Yu-Gi-Oh playstyle that will persevere regardless of new regulations, it's Synchro Masturbation. Really, the most outdated part of the card is the negation effect. What was once a win condition is now the trademark effect of half the cards in modern control decks, and it has been that way for a while. Back in 2011, the ability to completely shut down one card during either player's turn was a huge deal, but 8 years later, it's an extremely common boss monster effect in dozens of archetypes. That depressing bit of power creep aside, Quasar is still a goddamn beast of a monster and is worth constructing a deck around if you feel like taking time to build an imposing boss monster is more satisfying than having it handed out to you on a silver platter. Much like Stardust, realistically it's a lower grade, like 4.5, but Quasar has left enough of a legacy to warrant 5 Ds. Also, some of these ratings are a lot more flair and a lot less objective criteria, get used to it. Next up is the manga lineup of Stardust cards, acting as alternatives to the anime, starting with Stardust Spark Dragon. It has the same stats and summoning conditions as the original, besides being a light monster, and once per turn during either player's turn, you can target one face-up card you control, once during this turn it cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects. I honestly love this thing, mainly on the basis of how effectively the idea of an alternative Stardust Dragon was executed here. The effect works on the same principle of protection, but with its own pros and cons. The upside being that you don't have to tribute the card and it also protects stuff from battle destruction, but with the downside of not destroying the card the destruction effect is coming from. Most people nowadays will naturally tell you that they prefer the original Stardust, because negation and destruction is just that much more tempting than spot protection, but Spark stood on its own for a solid amount of time as a good generic level 8 synchro. Part of its representation has to be due to the light attribute, which made it a great target for Spirit Dragon's effect in Blue Eyes decks. Right now I'd say it's a 2.5 Ds for what it is, as the card has been suboptimal for a fairly long period of time, but in my personal preference I always kind of liked it more than the original. What I did not like more than the original was Stardust Chronicle Spark Dragon, which is the manga equivalent to Shooting Star. It's a level 10 with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, requires one tuner synchro monster and one or more non-tuner synchro monsters and must be synchro summoned. Once per turn during either player's turn, you can banish one synchro monster from your graveyard, this card is unaffected by other cards' effects for the rest of this turn. If this card in its owner's possession is destroyed by an opponent's card, by battle or card effect, you can target one of your banished dragon synchro monsters, special summon it. The one thing this bastard has going for it over Shooting Star 
Dalinar is a more generic summoning condition. The downsides? Everything else. For two Synchro Monsters whose levels equal 10, you get a 3000 beat stick which fuels its own effect immunity by draining your graveyard of valuable Synchros. If it happens to be destroyed, you can retrieve one of the Synchro Dragons you might have banished to activate this effect. If none of them were dragons, well, tough shit. I'd actually be somewhat inclined to say this is fine if it was a logical evolution of Spark Dragon and it let you give immunity to any card you control instead of just itself, but for all the effort you put into summon this thing, the benefits are just not worth it. You want a level 10 Synchro beat stick for protection? Just make Leo. It's stronger, a lot more generic, and a lot less demanding. 1.5 these. The final evolution in the manga lineup is a card whose name feels so jumbled that it rivals the Meteor Dragon Gemini. Stardust Cipher Divine Dragon has the same stats and summoning conditions as Quasar and the following effects. Must be Synchro summoned and cannot be special summoned by other ways. The first time each card you control will be destroyed each turn, by battle or card effect, it is not destroyed. Once per turn during either player's turn, when your opponent activates a monster effect, you can negate that effect and if you do, destroy one card on the field. You can banish this card from your graveyard, then target one level 8 or lower Stardust monster in your graveyard, special summon it. Kinda like what I said about Spark Dragon, I appreciate how this card mirrors Quasar in its own unique way. Instead of aggressive attacking, it gives plenty of protection to your field, the negation effect is stronger since it allows you to destroy any card instead of just the one you negated, but it's limited to monster effects, and the floating is slightly delayed and not as impressive, but can serve a purpose at different times during the duel. Decent card overall, doesn't really hold a candle to Quasar, but at least it's a lot more impressive visually. Honestly, I'm kinda biased against this thing, because it was revealed alongside Utopic Zexel during a time where Synchros were being heavily shafted and the rank 4 toolbox was more obnoxious than ever. Suddenly, Synchros get a worse Quasar and any deck that has 2 level 4s and a rank up magic gets access to Quick Play Cold Wave. Thanks for getting Argent Chaos Force banned, you fucking hellspawn. Sifra gets 4 of these. For the final dragon in the Stardust family, before moving on to the support, we have the ever so fabled Cosmic Blazar Dragon, who for the longest time only existed as 10 square pixels on one frame of a 5Ds episode. Finally, in early 2017, we were graced with a worthy successor to Quasar, with all of his Pendulum Dragon style disgusting Empreg orb fucking up what was generally solid visual design. Same stats and conditions as Quasar and Cipher, must be Synchro Summon and cannot be Special Summoned by other ways, and you can banish this card until the end phase to activate one of these quick effects. When your opponent activates a card or effect, negate the activation and if you do, destroy that card. When your opponent would summon a monster, negate the summon and if you do, destroy that monster. And when an opponent's monster declares an attack, negate the attack then end the battle phase. What I meant by a worthy successor to Quasar is that Cosmic Blazar Dragon took his place as a monster that negates harder than anything else in the game, a title formerly carried by Quasar all those years back. While ending your turn sitting on only one Quasar or Blazar isn't that big of a deal, putting in the extra effort to get out at least two of the big dick synchros before the opponent gets a chance to play brings back fond memories of the times where seeing even one of these things was enough to make people scoop. This makes Blazar a perfect modernization of the original level 12 Synchro Dragon, as the card is essentially a win condition if you manage to summon it on a frequent basis due to the sheer amount of plays it can flat out prevent. Playing this and Quasar in a deck is recommended, since if you can make one you can make the other, and most often you'll prefer to have both. The effect also thematically fits with the gimmick introduced by the original Stardust, making the whole deal come together in a neat full circle. Blazar gets a well-deserved 5 Ds. Stardust as an archetype slightly expands beyond this scope of cards. Among the notable once, Stardust Charge Warrior was a widely used generic level 6 synchro due to its accessibility and draw power, Stardust Warrior was a neat Quasar offshoot for Yusei's Synchro Warrior series of monsters, Malefic Stardust Dragon protected those Necro Valleys back in 2010, Stardustton is... here... Too. He's, he's here too, and Shooting Riser Dragon is a good synchro play extender and a bridge to higher level monsters. The spell and trap support isn't as memorable, mainly due to being either too specific, too costly, or just too slow. However, Starlight Road is a pretty decent format dependent counter card, Limit Overdrive is a huge shortcut to your Quasars, and Converging Wishes is pretty much a straight up adaptation of one of the most anime cards to ever grace the anime. The archetypes closely associated with Stardust are Yusei's Junk and Synchron monsters, but there's not really any cards directly tying them to Stardust, other than some conceptual ideas and artwork detail. Their generic synchro support as much as their stardust support. If I sat down here to analyze each and every synchron and their corresponding synchro warrior monster, we'd be here for a little too long. My overall thoughts on the stardust series are mostly positive, even though I'm not the biggest fan of their excessive focus on negation and lack of offensive options aside from shooting star and quasar. However, the evolutions do an exceptional job at sticking to their themes while feeling like logical additions to the series, and the impact some of them left on the game is undeniable. Visually, they're also generally sleek and eye-pleasing, aside from the occasional clusterfuck, so what really left with in the end is a bunch of cars attacked as perfectly solid representatives of the 5Ds era, and are admirably fun to build a deck around in this day and age. I just really don't like their weird harpoon noses, those, those things gotta go. Red Dragon Archfiend, yeah, oh.
Let's not beat around the bush here, by now the first Red Dragon Archfiend is absolute garbage. This is a generic level 8 Dark Dragon Synchro with 3000 attack and 2000 defense, and after damage calculation and discard attacks at defense position monster your opponent controls, destroy all defense position monsters your opponent controls. During your end phase, destroy all other monsters you control that did not declare an attack this turn. This card must be face up on the field to activate and resolve this effect. The best thing I can say about this effect is that it kicks off the RDA gimmick of it make thing blow up, but it does so in the least ceremonious way possible. Nuking defense position monsters is not gonna be relevant in any scenario besides dueling against super heavy samurai and uh -oh. exhaust stall and I'm being very liberal with my use of the word relevant here. The card did see competitive play in synchro toolbox decks on the virtue of it being a generic 3000 beater, but more often than not it was outclassed by Colossal Fighter, which did not take much effort to get above 3000 attack and had plenty of recovery alongside that. In its current state, the original Red Dragon Archfiend is damn near useless and only gets half a point above 1 due to its attack value. The assault mode counterpart, as one would expect, comes with 500 more attack and defense, the standard assault mode summoning condition and floating, and if this card attacks, destroy all other monsters after damage calculation. All other monsters... where? On, on the entire planet? Obviously it's referring to the field, I don't know why it was omitted from the effect, but there you have one way to rule shark somebody, just make them destroy all the monsters in their deck, because it's not specified otherwise. Anyway, the card is a bit too explosive for its own good. On one hand it can result in solid field clearing, but on the other it affects your field as well, so it's not really suitable for usage unless you can somehow go for an OTK. It's not the worst assault mode monster, but there's absolutely nothing noteworthy about it aside from the weird phrasing of the effect. Two of these. Majestic Red Dragon, also as one would expect, is two levels higher than RDA, has 1000 more attack and defense, and requires Majestic Dragon, Red Dragon Archfiend, and one more non-tuner monster. Cannot be destroyed by card effects. After damage calculation, if this card attacks, destroy all defense position monsters on the field. Once per turn, you can target one face-up monster your opponent controls, negate its effects, and if you do, this card gains attack equal to that monster's attack. These changes last until the end of this turn. During the end phase, target one Red Dragon Archfiend in your graveyard, return this card from the field to the extra deck, then special summon that target. Well, it keeps the abysmal defense destruction effect and the pointless self-bounce, and what you get for the effort with this one is a beater with okayish protection that can generally swing for at least 4000 damage with the effect applied. I guess it's fitting for the RDA evolution to be more offensively oriented, and you can definitely make a hard dent in the opponent's life points with this thing, but unless you have some sort of sentimental connection to Majestic Red Dragon, there is no reason why you wouldn't be playing any other Dragon OTK deck. Same thing I said about the last Majestic form applies here. Decent card that's just too hard to summon and requires some unreasonable maintenance. Two and a half Bs. Now, Red Dragon Archfiend didn't really have a shooting star dragon equivalent, but it did get a beefy max level variant way before Quasar showed up. Red Nova Dragon is a level 12 synchro with 3500 attack and 3000 defense, requires two tuners and Red Dragon Archfiend, and this card gains 500 attack for each tuner monster in your graveyard. Cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. When an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can target the attacking monster, banish this card, and if you do, negate an attack. During the next end phase, special summon this card banished by this effect. It's most of the stuff that was good about Majestic Red Dragon without any of the obnoxious downsides. Upon hitting the field, Red Nova Dragon has at least 4500 attack, usually even more than that, so its primary quality is being able to hit like a truck. The destruction protection that was fantastic back in the day is now just fine, and the attack negation was hardly ever the most relevant thing about the card, because nobody in their right mind was attacking while being stared down by 6000 attack Red Nova Dragon. The card's most curious aspect is the double tuner requirement, which the RDA lineup kind of adopted as its own gimmick, as out of the 7 synchros in the game that can be summoned with more than one tuner, 4 of them are Red Dragon Archfiend monsters. Even though it doesn't offer much in utility, Red Nova Dragon is still very welcome in RDA decks as the hardest hitter of the bunch, and decently wraps up the somewhat disappointing lineup of the original 5Ds anime's Red Dragon Archfiends. 3.5Ds. Moving on to the manga series, we notice that somebody in the localization department has to have been ostensibly horny for this monster because they named it Hot Red Dragon Archfiend. Uh -huh. Naturally, Hot Red's got the same stats and summoning condition, and once per turn during your main phase 1, you can destroy all other face-up attack position monsters on the field. Monsters other than this card cannot attack the turn you activate this effect. Now there we go, that's a generic synchro worthy of being played by the king. Make it clear the field and feel free to keep making plays completely uninterrupted by monsters at the measly cost of only being able to attack with Hot Red on that turn, which is perfectly serviceable given that it's a 3000 attack monster. It's an extremely blunt but still very impactful effect, which sadly comes at the downside of the card not being treated as the original Red Dragon Archfiend, a property necessary for some of the support cards to function properly. Honestly, it was kinda hard for me to process that there were absolutely no generic 3000 attack level 8 synchros between the original RDA and this card that came out more than 6 years after it, but I gotta give them props for sticking to the team. I love my nuke effects, so this one is a 3.5 Ds. 
To make up for the anime's lack of evolutions, the manga RDA gets not one, not two, but three of them. The first one being Hot Red Dragon Archfiend Abyss. These names are getting more incomprehensible than the goddamn Voynich manuscript. It's a level 9 synchro with 3300 attack and 2500 defense, requires one tuner and one non-tuner dark dragon synchro monster, and during either player's turn you can target one face-up card your opponent controls, negate its effects until the end of this turn. When this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you can target one tuner in your graveyard, special summon it in defense position. You can only use each effect of Hot Red Dragon Arch in the best once per turn. It's kind of funny that the closest that RDA's got to Quasar's spot negation effect is on a lower middle evolution of the Manga lineup, but in turn that makes Abyss one of their best monsters. At the time of this card's release, being able to negate any one card per turn was still kind of a big deal, despite it not destroying the card and only working for cards on the field. The card's utility is so good that it's even still seeing play in recent Guard Dragon variants, as their easy access to Exodeck Dragons makes Abyss's negation ability a handy thing to have around. It can also evolve from any base level RDA monster and enables you to continue your plays in main phase 2 if you destroy something by battle. It's a solid 4Ds here. Next up is the level 10 Hot Red Dragon Archfiend Bane. He's got 3500 attack and 3000 defense, same summoning condition as Abyss, and the following effect. You can tribute one monster, then target one Red Dragon Archfiend monster in your graveyard, special summon it. When this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you can special summon two tuners with the same level, one from your deck and one from your graveyard in defense position. You can only use each effect of Hot Red Dragon Archfiend Bane once per turn. This one always struck me a bit weird. After Abyss, which was clearly a solid monster on its own, we get a level 10 play extender? Don't get me wrong, with any field presence you can get a lot of mileage out of this guy's revival effect, and while the condition for the tuner summon effect is a tad annoying, he does offer a potentially massive amount of synchro extension. This guy really helps with building up the field, I just wish he did anything else. Doesn't really strike me as a level 10 Red Dragon Archfiend monster, you know? It's serviceable for what it is, but I'm giving it 3Ds. The final manga evolution and a complete turnaround from Red Nova Dragon is Hot Red Dragon Archfiend King of All Mouthfuls. It's a level 12 with 4000 attack and 3500 defense, requires two tuners and a Dark Dragon non-tuner synchro monster, and when this card is synchro summoned, you can activate this effect. For the rest of this turn, your opponent cannot activate cards, also cards your opponent controls cannot activate their effects. Your opponent cannot activate cards or effects in response to this effect's activation. If this card destroys a monster by battle, inflict damage to your opponent equal to that monster's original attack. If this card in its owner's possession is destroyed by an opponent's card, you can target one level 8 or lower Dark Dragon Synchro monster in your graveyard, special summon it. It's a bit better of a final boss than Red Nova, although for different reasons. It definitely hits pretty hard, completely disabling the opponent on summon can be nasty, unless they interrupted the card from being summoned in the first place, and the floating effect gives you a pretty decent chance to recover next turn if you revive a monster capable of easy nuking. It definitely looks and feels the part a lot better than Red Nova Dragon, but I'd say both are equally worth running as the granddaddy of your Red Dragon Archfiend deck if you have space for them. They serve different purposes and it's nice to have the option. King Calamity is not as bombastic as I initially expected it to be, and I wish RDAs had easier access to synchroing on the opponent's turn besides Synchro Call, because dropping this as a play interruption is absolutely hysterical, but he looks like he's gonna break my dad's kneecaps if I don't give him at least a 4. Finally, getting to the two RDAs of the Arc 5 series, first off we have the second alternative to the original Red Dragon Archfiend, which was pretty much as welcome as the first. Scarlight Red Dragon Archfiend has 3000 attack and 2500 defense, and its name becomes Red Dragon Archfiend while it's on the field or in the graveyard. Once per turn you can destroy as many other special summon effect monsters on the field as possible, with attack less than or equal to discards, then inflict 500 damage to your opponent for each monster destroyed. At the downside of being way more specific than Hot Red's nuke effect, this one doesn't prevent anything from attacking and deals some decent burn damage. Another subtle but fairly important addition is the card being treated as the original Red Dragon Archfiend while on the field or in the graveyard, because some of the synchros and more than one support card specifically require the original. It used to be a close tie between this card and Hot Red, but today I would definitely call this one the better option. 40s. The final RDA synchro on the repertoire today is Tyrant Red Dragon Archfiend. A level 10 with 3500 attack and 3000 defense, requires two tuners and one or more non-tuner monsters, must be synchro summoned and cannot be special summoned by other ways. You can only use each of these effects of Tyrant Red Dragon Archfiend once per turn. During your main phase, you can destroy all other cards on the field. Also, for the rest of this turn, other monsters you control cannot attack. During either player's battle phase, when a spell or trap is activated, you can negate the activation and if you do, destroy that card, and if you do that, this card gains 500 attack. Honestly, this feels more like an upgrade to Hot Red than any of the other evolutions from the manga ever did. The first effect is straight up a stronger version of Hot Red's nuke with the exact same restriction, and the second one is just battle trap elimination, which is something that felt a bit outdated when the card came out and is basically irrelevant now. The card is slightly easier to summon than the other higher level RDA monsters, mainly due to it being level 10 and not requiring a specific non-tuner, so while it might not be a consistent game ender, a somewhat easily accessible field nook is usually good to have around. 3Ds. 
The archetype directly associated with the RDA monsters are Resonators, who didn't really have a gimmick during the anime other than being tuners and being used by Jack, but as legacy support goes, that's apparently all you need. The most notable cards here include Red Resonator, which is usually a free synchro and fairly often a decent life point boost, Chain Resonator for easy double tuning, Creation Resonator because free material, Synchron Resonator because free material and recovery, and Resonator call for free consistency. Red Splinter and Red Vorg are also decent options, and Red Rising Dragon is essentially the RDA equivalent to shooting Riser. Dragon. Red Dragon Archfiend, as in the original monster, not the archetype, also has a weirdly expansive set of back row support, of which not much is really worth talking about. Although it does bring up the question, what would they name Red Supremacy if it was a blue eyes support card? In terms of interaction and support, the Red Dragon Archfiend family of monsters is a lot more close-knit than Stardust. And fittingly so, because it's made to contrast Stardust to a significant degree, due to being based specifically around the destruction that Stardust prevents. The excessive usage of force is very well conveyed in most of the RDA effects, with a solid number of them affecting even your own feel due to the overwhelming amount of power on display. I much prefer the direction that RDA support took over Stardust, because it not only makes a deck based entirely around it a viable option, but gives a lot of thematic consistency to their hierarchy of synchros. If you're not too entertained by Stardust Dragon's heavy focus on control and negation, you might have a better time with Red Dragon Archfiend's way more aggressive playstyle, and having the option in the first place is always appreciated. Blackwing Dragon! Oh no! Okay, let's put a spotlight on this shit show real quick. Blackwing Dragon is a level 8 generic Dark Dragon Synchro with 2800 attack and 1600 defense, and if you would take damage from a card effect, place one Black Feather counter on this card instead. This card loses 700 attack for each Black Feather counter on it. Once per turn you can remove all Black Feather counters on this card, then target one face-up monster your opponent controls, that target loses 700 attack for each Black Feather counter you removed, and if it does, inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack lost by this effect. Well, uh, it... Counters Trickstar burn damage and, and, and wave motion cannon? I mean, it dies to a gust of wind, but I'm grasping at straws to find some positives here, you get me? There's no cleaner indication that lore wise this thing wasn't supposed to exist than taking one look at its fucking effect. Half a D, it's beyond salvation. The one half it got is because they cared enough to throw a bone to this thing by giving it two cards worth of support ten years later. Thankfully, this abomination had no evolutions, so we're just left with the manga retrain and things don't exactly improve that much. Black Feather Dark Rage Dragon, which may be some of the most tragic name wasters in this game, has the following effect. Once per turn when you take damage, you can send up to 5 cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard. Then if any monsters were sent to the graveyard by this effect, this card gains 400 attack. It's a light sworn that was cast out from the church due to consorting with Paimon, the king of hell. To get this effect off, you either have to rely on your opponent beating the hell out of you, or pray that one Zephyros or Triclon you have somehow hits the graveyard while this is on the field. This is simultaneously better and worse than the original, but the bar has never been set lower, so it's not really saying much. Half a D for this one too. I'm not even gonna give these the time of my day to elaborate on how they synergize with Black Wings, mostly because they don't, but I will point out that if you have some morbid interest in Black Wing Dragon, they recently printed Blackwing Oster the Southwind and Blackbird Close is a sort of crutch to make you at the very least consider playing the dragon in a Blackwing deck. They're basically giving you incentive to shit out a beat stick with a bad attack manipulation effect and it technically kinda works, as much as it disgusts me to present the implication. Moving on and not looking back. A black horse, drag horse. Now here's a couple of fan favorites, first being Black Rose Dragon, a level 7 fire dragon with 2400 attack and 1800 defense, which once per turn lets you banish one plant monster from your graveyard, then target one defense position monster your opponent controls, change that target to face up attack position and if you do, its attack becomes zero until the end of this turn. Oh, also, in a synchro summon you get to destroy all cards on the field. Yeah, did you know that besides the handy battle position changing effect, Black Rose Dragon can also nuke the field on summon? Crazy, I know. Jokes aside, this is a hilarious card, mainly because it was the one out Synchro's had to anything and everything for a pretty long time, and any level 3 tuner with a level 4 monster could result in a complete field wipe to punish over extenders Nibiru style 11 years before Nibiru even existed. The legacy of easily accessible nukes would continue with Excidon some years later, but the amount of work Black Rose put in is undeniable. The other effect? Uh, well, it exists. I mean, it might as well not, but the first effect is just that good and iconic that the card deserves at least a 4.5, if anything, for the legacy. The manga variant, Black Rose Moonlight Dragon, is light attribute, and if this card is special summoned or a level 5 or higher monster is special summoned to your opponent's side of the field, target one special summon monster your opponent controls, return that target to the hand. You can only use this effect of Black Rose Moonlight Dragon once per turn. This is also a pretty great card. Bounce on summon is pretty sweet, and when playing against a deck relying on making high-level monsters, Moonlight was essentially a direct counter. Its attribute also made it a sublime 
slime target for Spirit Dragon's effect during Blue Eyes format, especially given that it could also cripple other Blue Eyes decks. Sadly, nowadays you might not be getting that much use out of it besides bouncing a straight Thunder Dragon, but the card has had its time in the spotlight at the very least. For these. Up until recently, Black Rose didn't really have an archetype associated with it, as much as it worked somewhat in tandem with generic plant synchro stuff. Recently, in the Sisters of the Rose Duelist pack, it was expanded with a couple of cards as the Rose Dragon archetype, which is... okay. It doesn't really have a super concrete playstyle besides just being plant-type good stuff that also happens to kinda synergize with Black Rose. It won't be topping left and right, but I guess it does the trick if you're just looking to get some more mileage out of Black Rose. And I could see why you would, because, again, this is definitely an iconic synchro monster whose effect never really gets boring to pull off, and is probably one of the most beautiful dragons in the game from a visual side. Plants and synchros go together since way back, and while their mechanical synergy isn't quite condensed within this card, the legacy is definitely felt. P -p -p power to drag. Look, I already reviewed Morphtronics two years ago, and the video has essentially not aged a day since then, especially when it comes to the viability of the Power Tool Dragon lineup. I'd just be paraphrasing stuff I said back then because nothing happened in the span of those two years that would make these cards worth bringing up for a second opinion. If you just want flat, meaningless numbers, Power Tool is a 2.5 and the others are a 2. Really, the most noteworthy thing to add here is that Livestream Dragon appeared in a second 5Ds ending 100 episodes before it was actually summoned in the anime. Holy mother of bad planning. Ancient Fairy Dragon Ancient Fairy Dragon is a generic level 7 with 2100 attack and 3000 defense, and once per turn, you can special summon one level 4 or lower monster from your hand. You cannot conduct your battle phase the turn you activate this effect. Once per turn, you can destroy as many field spells on the field as possible, and if you do, gain 1000 life points, then you can add one field spell from your deck to your hand. As you may be aware, this lanky motherfucker is banned and has been for a year now. The primary reason for this being that its effects are so hilariously in line with things that modern FTKs and general excessive combo decks love to incessantly abuse that it genuinely feels like the card was designed 8 years in advance. It took a bit of time to hit its stride, but unfortunately soon after hitting it, it also hit a fat brick wall in the form of a ban list, never to be seen again for what I imagine is gonna be a long time. Obviously a good card, I just don't know how to rate it. Ban these out of 5? The last sign of dragon on today's repertoire is the manga version Ancient Pixie Dragon. It's a dark monster and to everybody's shock it has the same stats as the original, and after resolving a field spell card that was activated during your turn, draw one card. You can only use this effect of Ancient Pixie Dragon once per Turn. Once per turn, you can target one face-up attack position monster on the field, destroy that target. There must be a face-up field spell card on the field to activate and to resolve this effect. Much like Power Tool Mecha Dragon is to the original Power Tool, Pixie Dragon offers a cute alternative to Ancient Fairy Dragon's effect, which sadly just misses the mark of relevancy. The hard once per turn piece of draw power it offers is neat, but nothing special, definitely not worth making a level 7 synchro for. The spot removal is also fine, but everyone would naturally much prefer the play extension the original offered. This is a 2.5 Ds that would be bordering on a 3 if it had a dedicated archetype to go with, but it doesn't. Yeah, the Ancient Fairy Dragon series, if you can even call it that, is the only Sino Dragon branch without a related archetype. The character who used it in the anime ran a bunch of terrible random cards only related by being vaguely fairy tale themed, and Ancient Fairy Dragon didn't exactly tie them together in some extraordinarily special way. As far as Konami is concerned, the Ancient Fairy Dragon and anything related to it might as well not exist, so I too might as well wrap it up here. Quick shout out to Ultimaya Zulkin, a synchro based on a manga monster themed after the Crimson Dragon, a great card which was designed to give you access to any Sino Dragon, but was generally used for quickly shitting out Crystal Wing, Ultimate Ulbish Balkin, which was supposed to be an evolution of Ultimaya but is instead just a terribly gimmicky OTK card, and finally the Dual Link Dragon, one of the worst cards ever printed, I think. They had to have been actively going out of their way to make this thing as unplayable as humanly possible, because it takes genuine effort to come up with something this useless in this day and age. It honestly warrants the kudos for this reason, it is just that impressively bad. Feels a bit weird that they're attaching the name of a game they're shilling so hard onto this abomination of a monster, but the jokes about Konami's naming conventions are a horse that's deader than Match Inspector Kirin on a ban list. Thanks for watching. Hey there, congratulations on making it this far into the video, because I honestly did not expect this to be even 20 minutes long, let alone pushing 35. This wasn't exactly an archetype archive, so I took this as a liberty to not bother myself with a live-action intro or an Ojama Lime skit, because frankly those can be pretty taxing to edit sometimes. I just want to say thank you for watching and point out that you can watch me infrequently play video games on Twitch, follow me on Twitter for a lot of complaining, dumb anime shit and stream announcements, and you can donate to the Patreon, which is just a tip jar for the time being. The links to all of those are in the description, which is accessible only by very handsome people, so feel free to try your luck at it. I'll see you next time.